I lost my G spot. It's in my elbow, right? What is the G spot? What? I've been scouring my comment section and today we are going to be tackling some of the most embarrassing medical questions on the planet. Things that may make you cringe, things that you may have never learned about in school that are causing you some serious stress in your life and more. But fair warning to you all, sometimes these questions can get a little bit out there. But today, we're not holding back at all and we're tackling them. But before we get into it, if you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Dr. Jordan Wagner. If you enjoy the educational reaction videos and other stuff that you see here on this channel, please smash that subscribe button and turn your bell notifications on. That way, you learn when I post a new video. All right, let's dive right in. Do women's farts actually smell better than men's farts? Is this true? Against popular belief, women's farts smell worse than men's farts. Yes. And it's probably related to frequency. Men are all about quantity. Women are about quality. There has been studies to actually show that women's farts are a little bit more odiferous. The smell of a fart is actually related to the hydrogen sulfide that's in it. And depending also what you're eating and your diet, it also depends on how much sulfur is actually produced. But yep, that is opposite what you would think. Women actually have stinkier farts than men. If I slowly drink water indefinitely, can I slowly pee uninterrupted indefinitely? Your collecting system takes time to process the water and or fluids or whatever you're drinking and then puts it into your urine. But if you slowly sip things, you're not just gonna be able to sip slowly and pee continuously, it's not possible. And there's also muscular contractions that occur in your bladder to actually squeeze it out. For you to be able to urinate, your brain bladder interaction has to be connected well to the distension of your bladder. And then your brain tells your body to get the urine out to urinate, you'd have to have full contraction of your bladder all the time with relaxation of your sphincters. Again, you wouldn't be able to do that either. Hey doc, thanks for answering our questions. My hands get sweaty a lot and it bothers me when I'm trying to use my phone or when I want to write something. Is there any way to stop this much sweating? Sweaty hands called Palmer hyperhidrosis. Most of the time it's genetic. They actually don't really know exactly why some people have more sweaty hands than others. There are different potential treatments that you can do. One, which is interesting, is you can use an antiperspirant. Your normal antiperspirant that people would use for your armpits, you can potentially use it on your hands. And then there are clinical grade antiperspirants that you can get a prescription for. There's another type of therapy called iontophoresis, a type of like electrical type stimulation relating to the hands to try to get them to stop sweating as much. And some people have had great success, almost up to like 80%. And then if that doesn't work, you could try to use Botox. So Botox has anything to do with the paralyzation of potentially the glands. People who have sweaty armpits could do the same thing. These are different therapies that you can try. If you have Palmer hyperhidrosis, check in with your doctor, your healthcare provider, bring it up and bring up some of these suggested type of therapies and see if you can get going and see if we can get this under control. So I have an odd question. Can a jawbreaker really break your jaw? Probably not. Jawbreaker is made to be like licked and to be enjoyed slowly and sucked on and break down and let the enzymes of your saliva break it down. You're not supposed to be trying to chomp on it. I have seen where jawbreakers can actually cause you to dislocate your jaw. What happens is at the jaw up top at your joint, your TMJ, it's like a little hook here. And so as you open the jaw, Click! It can pop right out and then you're stuck with your jaw open. When you're having any large hard candies in your mouth, you definitely can break a tooth, fracture a tooth, and cause issues, and then you gotta go to your dentist. ER doctors typically don't take care of teeth. Hey, Dr. Wagner, whenever I eat something sour, my father says that eating too much sour food can lead to infertility in men. Please explain whether or not that is true. No, so sometimes our parents say things to scare us into not eating something, and that way we don't do it. But in general, sour candies, sour things have like acid, so citric acid to make the flavor. Could you give this sensation in the mouth that maybe you're burning the layers of your tongue off or you can change the acidity environment of your stomach to make it even more acidic, which could cause irritation to your stomach, irritation to your esophagus. Back to the original question, will eating sour things and sour candies cause infertility in men? No, 
it does not. Question for a future video. What color and consistency should your semen be on average? Can things like your diet and not ejaculating often affect it? So good question. What is the normal average color of semen? Semen's color is a white with a whitish gray hue to it. It's normal, but there's a full spectrum. Green, it could be yellow, bright yellow. It could be pink, it could be brown. So all these other spectrums of the rainbow are related to something else going on. There are a lot of things that can affect it. Different systemic diseases, autoimmune diseases, liver diseases. So consistency relating to dehydration, related to the hydration status, as well as what you're eating and then how frequently you're going or how often you are ejaculating. Sometimes if you're not going very often, you're going to have a large amount, but it could also be very concentrated in the sense that you're not having as much fluid within that ejaculate. If you're having abnormal, consistent changes to your ejaculate, definitely get an evaluation by your doctor and potentially a urologist. Hey, Dr. Jordan, I was wondering, does being hypermobile or double jointed for those who don't know have any setback? I've noticed I can't do some things that others can, but is it damaging in later in life? Hypermobility or double jointedness basically means that there's a laxity of the attachment of your ligaments. But if you just have hypermobility of the joints, is it an issue per se long term? Not really, as long as things are controlled. Making sure you're not having a significant amount of stretch on the joints that over a long period of time will cause injuries. Doing activities that increase your risk for shoulder dislocations, which is common in somebody with hypermobile joints. There are things that you need to do, you know, exercising and strength training to keep all the muscles and the tendons well intact around those joints to help support those ligaments. Then being careful with the activities that you're doing to reduce the chances of dislocations and the hypermobilization of the joint itself. And then sometimes there are some dietary changes that you could do that help with this type of process with joint mobility. There's some like different types of elimination diets that you can look into that might be helpful. In long-term, long-term damage, are you gonna do anything bad? Typically not, unless you have like 20 shoulder dislocations and you're gonna have chronic issues related to that. Hey, Dr. Wagner, I wanna ask you, is it true we breathe with only one nostril? I read it somewhere. We got two nostrils. First thing I'll say is we do have a dominant side nostril at times when we breathe. So sometimes it actually switches. Most most people have deviated symptoms. So sometimes it's actually easier to breathe through the side that it's opposite the deviation because it's larger. And actually breathing through your nose is very beneficial. It has to do with increased formants. It calms us down, reduces anxiety and depression. It actually filters and warms the air for us versus like mouth breathing. Mouth breathing increases your risk of enamel issues because you can get dry mouth. There's actually people out there that actually do specific nose breathing techniques where they actually breathe through one nostril at a time. And it actually also has to do with the tissue within the nose, its interaction with our brain and the sensitivity of the environment that it affects us. There are some issues relating to your nervous system, your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system with the tissue in our nose. Really important to try to breathe when you can through your nose and your body will actually be grateful for it. Hey, Dr. Wagner, I have a serious question that I must ask. What are the chances of me getting an STI through oral sex? Love your videos. You can get all the STDs, STIs, via oral sex, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes. And what is the risk? It's around anywhere between two to 10%. But we see this in the emergency department a lot. You'd be surprised where people come in with chlamydia of their eye, conjunctivitis caused by chlamydia or gonorrhea. We see people who have pharyngitis, which is inflammation of the throat, typically caused by strep. Sometimes we have it via chlamydia or gonorrhea. And then sometimes you can have syphilis lesions, which are painless ulcers that can form in the mouth. Most of these are easily treated, but you gotta be really careful with STIs. Untreated STIs can cause strictures within your urethra. That is when you actually have narrowing of your pee hole anywhere along your shaft. Not cool. Don't want that. You don't have to have that stretched open. So please get checked, have safe sexual practices. Your risk of contracting an STI via oral sex is not zero. It is up to two to 10% and all the way up to almost 40% in certain cases. Why do all male doctors manspread when they sit down? I swear every male doctor I've had always sat close to me, wore tight fitted khakis and let it all hang out. I'm not on that list. 
this because I don't wear khakis at work. I can't speak for all the physicians, specifically the male physicians out there, that man spread with khakis on their chair that are doing the exam at their offices. But what I can say is that most likely the reason they're doing it is to get closer to get a better exam. If your legs are straight out, you can't get close in to examine somebody's eye, which you literally have to be this far away, or look in their ears, which are right next to the face, or get your stethoscope, which the tubing is only this long to get close. It has nothing to do with anybody showing their man part that I know of. I lost my G-spot. It's in my elbow, right? What is the G-spot? What the G-spot? What the heck is the G-spot? The G-spot is also known as the Grafenberg spot. A few inches inside the vagina on the upper wall that is a highly sensitive area, a good sensitive area, that if touched or stimulated could give good feelings and could actually swell. When stimulated, it's good and it arouses the person. It is a little bit different in every individual because it's anatomy. So this is not on or in your elbow. It's not to be confused with your funny bone. Those are some crazy, awesome, interesting, thought-provoking questions that I hope I was able to answer some of the questions that you guys have been having burning for a long time. If you guys like this video, check out this playlist right here of all the embarrassing medical questions and topics that we've discussed in the past. Thank you so much for watching and stay healthy, my friends.